go. Welcome back to the Global AI Student Conference, and we have our next speaker is Matt Elland, who is an instructor at Tech Elevator, and they will be giving a talk on automating my dog with Azure Cognitive Services. And it'll be a video that I'll play in just a moment. Hello, Global AI Student Conference. I am Matt Eland, or at Man on Twitter, and this is Automating My Dog with Azure Cognitive Services. Uh, so in order to speak here, you have to either be a student or a teacher, and it turns out I'm actually both. I teach software engineering professionally at Tech Elevator, and I'm also a master's in science and data analytics student at Franklin University. In addition to these things, I speak frequently in my communities and tend to talk a lot about Azure Machine Learning, Azure Cognitive Services, Artificial Intelligence, Data Science, and you know, ordinary .NET development. So these are kind of my topics of interest. So Azure Cognitive Services is really interesting to me because it's kind of this intersection of my two worlds. So it's software engineering with C Sharp and .NET, and it's also you know, data science and artificial intelligence and being able to use all of these pre-built APIs that Microsoft has given us to do all these data science tasks without having to you know, train a machine learning model, get deep into data science and things like that. So Azure Cognitive Services is really this sort of a, a suite of AI as a service offerings where you can say like, hey, I really need something to process images and classify images and detect objects in this, or I really need something to uh, generate speech from text or uh, understand the sentiment of text. And you pay basically by the usage of how many API calls you make without having to get a master's degree in data science. So very, very fancy stuff. I like it a lot. And so I decided to talk about it in my community. And whenever I'm giving a talk, I like to have kind of a fun spin to things. So I thought, what's the strangest way I could give a talk that would still be informational? And I came up with, well, thinking about my dog. Uh, so this is uh, Jester the Cairn Terrier, and he is a wonderful dog. He's a very good boy. He's also a very loud boy. Okay, So he, he does a lot of things out there in the world. Uh, and I said, you know, it'd be nice if I could relieve him of some of his responsibilities. If I could find a system that could go out there and look for animals for him out the window and bark at those animals in a season. And, you know, listening to commands and recognizing words and identifying the spoken commands. And I thought about it and I thought, well, wait a minute, Azure Cognitive Services can actually do all of these things. So wouldn't it be fun to give a talk about how I could make my dog's life easier by automating some of his more mundane tasks, such as looking out the window and barking at rabbits? And yes, this is absolutely ridiculous talk, but that's kind of the point. We want to use some, some humor and whimsy to talk about some really interesting things. So I'm going to demo to you a solution that involves Azure Cognitive Services. And we're going to talk about entity recognition, sentiment analysis, language understanding, uh, computer vision, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, and, you know, other considerations, right? So we're going to tie all of this together with .NET code uh, written in C Sharp. And we're going to see how this can tell kind of a, a coherent story and build an application that's, you know, A, ridiculous, but B, could legitimately be used to automate my dog's core tasks, if only he would listen. So let's take a look at the application, and I'll come back and kind of walk you through its code. Hello there. All right, so here we are in the app, and the first thing you'll notice is it, it talked to me uh, using a, a text-to-speech. So let's have it look at some pictures. So first, I will show it a picture of me back when I was a developer. And it finds a bunch of things in that picture. Uh, and if I have Jester take a look at that picture, the results of that. Nothing to bark at, but here's some things I saw. A man sitting at a desk with a computer and a chair, monitor, person, indoor, clothing. And actually tells us a lot about that image. Now, if I show him another picture, such as a, a squirrel uh, sitting, sitting on a peg, you get a different set and it finds a bunch of different things and Jester has a different opinion because it saw an animal. I saw a squirrel eating a nut, bark, bark, bark. So that is uh, essentially so the, the image recognition capabilities. So let's take a look at the listening to commands. If you want to go on a walk, 
and it was able to determine that I said, do you want to go on a walk? And it analyzed the sentiment and key phrases, and it mapped it to an intent we'll talk about later. And it's Why a, yes, Jester does want to go on a walk. Now, I could also say something different, such as, are you a good boy? And it interpreted it differently. Jester is a good doggo. So that's the app. It works pretty well. Uh, let's talk about how it works. Goodbye, friend. All right, let's talk a little bit about how this works. So in order to make any of this possible, you need an Azure Cognitive Services instance on your Azure account. Okay? So if you don't have an Azure account, you can always go out and create a free one, uh, which is free for uh, you know a year or so. You get a number of free credits uh, for the first month and then some persistently free things for the next 12 months and then persistent free things after that. Uh, but in order to do anything with Azure Cognitive Services, you need to go in and search for a Cognitive Services instance and go ahead and create that. Now you'll need to tell it a resource group that it belongs to. You also need to tell it what region it needs to be in. Okay, this is usually gonna be something close to you and your users. Finally, you give it a name and you choose a pricing tier. You tell it to create and it goes ahead and creates it. So once you have that, you now can go in and find the uh, endpoints and keys for this. So these are secure keys that you can use to access your, your Azure Cognitive Services instance from your .NET code. So keep these things secure. I would recommend not uh, checking these things into source control, but rather uh, putting them into your application configuration files, storing them in Key Vault, something like that. Um, and uh, just not having them inside a Git or whatever you're using for source control. Uh, but you can grab the key out of this uh, using the keys and endpoints pane in the Azure uh, in Azure, and you can also grab the endpoint as well. Now, once you do that, now we can start to get into the code and how this works. So, I'm gonna the application I created was in .NET. Uh, so, inside of Visual Studio, I went in and I added references to all the various services I was going to use inside of Azure Cognitive Services. There's no one. Uh, library that you're going to use uh, to add a NuGet package for. Instead, it's very piecemeal. You're going to say, oh, I need uh, I need speech. I need language. I need computer vision. I need all these things. And so you're going to kind of only include what you need, right? So you go to NuGet package manager, you go in there and you just uh, select the things that you want and it installs them for you and you're great. Okay. Now, next thing we do, uh, let's talk about how the various features work, starting with text to speech, because really it's the simplest. With text to speech, you are creating a speech config object. So the speech config object, uh, it has your, uh, your Azure Cognitive Services key, uh, and it also has the region name uh, for your, that, that's the region that you deploy your Cognitive Services instance to. Next, you tell it what voice to use. I chose uh, Guy Neural. Uh, this is a neural voice, which is uh, a little bit more uh, believable and realistic than a non-neural voice, and Microsoft is creating more and more neural voices all the time for various locales throughout the world. Uh, so check the full list of those out, they're pretty awesome. Um, and then the next thing I do I, is I'm creating a speech synthesizer and I'm awaiting it speak text ASIC. And this is actually going to go out there and it's going to uh, find my default speakers and it's going to pipe the output of that uh, through my speakers. So this is actually all the code I need to make my application speak to the user. Now, if you don't want to be doing this all the time, you could actually go out there, call this method, and save the result to a WAV file, uh, and then you can go in and you can play it later on in your application, so you might be playing, uh, paying only once to generate that, 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 uh, that file. But if you need to say something dynamic, that's not as much of an option. But if it's always the same thing every time, you, know, you, you can just save it to a file and you'll be fine. Okay, so that's uh, speech synthesis or uh, text-to-speech. Now, speech to text is you know fairly similar, uh, but in a little bit more code. So with speech recognition or speech to text, we create a speech recognizer. We give it the same speech config, but we don't necessarily need to specify the voice this time around, uh, but we are telling it the key in the Azure, a Azure region. Uh, and then we're calling recognizer recognize once async. There's also ways of recognizing things in a stream and the like, but those get a lot more complex. So recognize once async is very smart. It listens on your default microphone and it waits for you to stop talking. Now, if it did, if your microphone's not on or you're muted or whatever it might be, it's just going to give you back a, hey, I, 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 I didn't recognize anything, a no match result. But normally you're going to get a recognized speech and you'll be able to get like access to the result.txt. So this 
works remarkably well, at least in quiet environments. I've not tested this thoroughly in, acti in active environments like uh, cafes and the like. I've not had a lot of different people uh, test it with their voices, but I assume <laughs> I'm actually very confident that Microsoft has as well. Uh, so speech recognition, um, there's a little bit to it, but there's not much to it. It's, it's really fairly simple and it works pretty well. Now, computer vision is a lot more complex because there's a lot of aspects to computer vision. It depends on what you care about. Now, first thing you might want to do is you might, well, you need to do <laughs> is you need to actually go out there and you need to uh, basically load your image. So in this code here, I am loading the image from a file. I'm loading it into, a, in, into an image stream, and then I'm calling a computer vision client, analyze image in stream async. And I'm telling it what features I care about. This is the, the task I want it to, uh, to conduct. So the image analysis in, in Azure Cognitive Services, it's really one endpoint that you call to do a whole lot of different analysis results. Now, each one of those things you're paying for. So if you really only need, let's say, uh, the description of your image, just tell it that's all I care about. But you can use the same endpoint to get all sorts of different pieces of information about your image if your application needs them. So in this case, I'm asking for the categories, the description, the image type, the tags, and any objects inside the image. Uh, now, once I've done that, I have this anal image analysis result, and I can look at the results of that. So here I can take a look at the captions that are present on this image. Um, and so it's going to give me basically an auto-generated caption as to what is in my image, which is pretty neat. Um, I'm also able to uh, take a look at the tags and categories present in an image. Right? So I can loop over all the tags and the categories applied to the image, and I can display the confidence level that Azure had that each one was present. And uh, that, that will tell you a lot about what's in the image in particular. The tags API is really, really helpful for that. The categories are more broad, like nature and things like that. But the tags can say, I think this is an Eastern tree squirrel uh, with a 86% uh, probability. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, object detection. Object detection is a big one. So with object detection, you're actually getting not just what's in my image, but where it is. It gives you a rectangle for the things it was able to, no uh, to, to notice. And so you can look at these, these rectangles uh, by getting at the object re uh, rectangle. It gives you this bounding rect. And you can look at the X and Y and the width and height, and you can kind of get a sense for where in your image something is. So that's really, really handy if you want to understand, you know, what is actually in your image and where is it in your image. So not just what's in my image, but where is it in my image. Okay. So all of this, you know, it it winds up with this this uh, this output that we saw earlier in the demo. Uh, but there's a lot we can do with image analysis, and it all really flows through that one endpoint. So it's super convenient. I really love it. Uh, text analysis is a little bit different. So it has multiple endpoints. So the very first one you might want to do would be language detection. This, this says, hey, what language is the, te the text in? Is it in English? Is it in something else? And you, in order to do this, you need to create a text analytics client. It's like, hey, here's my cognitive services key. Here's the endpoint I want you to call out to. Remember, you get your key and your endpoint from the keys and endpoints blade in the Azure portal. And these are secure things, particularly your Azure cognitive services key. So if somebody else has that, they can use it to make calls and have you pay for it. So you don't want to share that or check it into source control, especially if you're just doing open source development. Okay, so the next thing you do, you're doing is you're going out and you're saying like, hey, I want to detect the language. I can even give it a hint as to what country I'm in if I want to, if I think most of my users are going to be in the same country. Um, and then it's going to loop over all the languages it detects. So uh, pretty cool. Key phrase detection is basically kind of a summarization sort of API. So you can loop over that. You can say, hey, I want to get my key phrase, phrases asynchronously. Here's the language that I, I believe this is in. Here's the text. And it goes out and it gives you all the key phrases it finds. Very good for reducing large periods of text to just key bullet points. Entity recognition lets you find named people, places, events, things like that in periods of text. So you can take a look at this and it can scan and highlight the key players in a passage of text. So really good for automated analysis of documents and things like that. Sentiment analysis, you'll see this applied a lot to social media. Uh, if you want to find out if the sentiment or, you know, uh, someone's happy, sad, angry, whatever it might be, uh, it will give you a, a value ranging from one to negative one, with one meaning I'm, I'm super happy and negative one meaning I'm pretty mad right now. 
and zero meaning uh, about neutral sentiment. Okay? So you can use this to to determine like how do people feel about your products and brands and things like that if you wanted to. So very common case for text analysis. So again, we see uh, you know values outputting like this. It says, hey, hey, I found English in this. The key phrases were cognitive services. I found these entities and that kind of thing. So very cool. Now, this last one, uh, the last thing that powered this application is something called language understanding or Lewis or Luis. I hear different pronunciations for that. I Before we get into this, I do want to say that this is more of a deprecated aspect of Azure. Uh, the, uh, the sequel to this is uh, co uh, conversational language understanding or Clue, uh, which I will be writing about actually later on this week. So take a look at that on accessibleai.dev if you want to see the differences between Clue and Lewis, but they're very, very similar. It's just uh, Clue is the newer way of doing this, but they both work exactly the same, just different areas of Azure. So both work off of something called an intent. An intent is basically command your application supports. My application supports responding to the phrase good boy and responding to the phrase walk, right? It, it understands those things. It also has handling for the non-intent. So you said something I don't recognize, I don't understand. So these are kind of the three things that the application can respond to, good boy, walk, and none. Now, the user is not saying those things. The user is saying something else. The thing that the user says is called an utterance. So we map each individual utterance to a specific intent. So I might have multiple utterances that go to the same intent. For example, do you want to go on a walk? And hey, what do you think about a walk right now? Or do you want to go on a stroll? Those all map to the walk intent, right? So we can put in user utterances to train our application inside of Lewis or Clue, and it's going to say, oh, okay, I understand that this utterance goes to that intent. You, you're telling it what it does. And then you train it to recognize that. And when the user types in something new or says something new that your application has never seen before, it says, how similar is it to this other thing over here? I think it's pretty similar to some of the utterances for this walk intent, or uh, I'm going to map it to that one. And over time, you find yourself adding more utterances to Lewis or Clue to help you know, they respond to the things that users are saying to your application or the different grammar they're using and things like that. Okay. So uh, the code for this, uh, for Lewis, is pretty simple. For Clue, last time I checked, it's not, uh, which is why that's a separate article. Uh, but Lewis, you are actually creating a new Azure API key service client credentials like we have before, giving it your Azure Cognitive Services key. Uh, and then you're creating a runtime client, Lewis runtime client. You're telling it what endpoint to use. And then you are giving it the, the GUID of your Lewis applications. It's something you find in the Lewis portal, right? Um, and you're telling it whether to use the staging or portal environment, or sorry, staging or, staging or production environment. Now, once you have that down, you are going to then go in and try to map the user's utterance to an intent. So now we're actually going out, we're calling out to Lewis, we're saying like, hey, uh, here's my message, I wanna get a uh, response. So uh, we say, here's my request, give me my prediction uh, asynchronously. And we get back our prediction response. Now, looking at that, we can actually go in and see, oh, okay, well, here is the result of that. Here's my most likely prediction, and here's all the other intents that it tried to map to and the confidence of each one. So this is gonna tell you not only the top intent, but it's also gonna tell you the other ones it considered and how likely they were. So you can take this result and you can say like, hey, the top intent was walk, but I also matched onto these other things with a certain degree of confidence. So this lets you really build a chat bot or a conversational AI solution uh, in without having to do a whole lot of data science. You know, I just recently wrote an article on ML.net and how uh, that was actually pretty complex to map utterances to intents manually. Uh, so Azure Cognitive Services gives us a nice and friendly way without having to do a whole lot of data science under the hood. So uh, in conclusion, you know, we did a lot of things. We were able to automate a lot of capabilities. Um, we were able to uh, detect objects of interest with computer vision and identify whether or not they had things worth barking at. We were able to respond to certain occurrences uh, using text-to-speech that made gesture bark or the equivalent of barking in this, in this example. Uh, and we were also able to understand human speech and sent uh, sentiment using the speech-to-text and text analysis and Lewis or Clue APIs 
Um, so all told, Azure Cognitive Services let us build an application without having to do a whole lot of complex code. So it lets you take a new, a new application or build an existing application uh, and, and, and build them up and add on new capabilities to you know, respond to users in more intelligent ways. You can think about this application, all the other things I might add to it, um, such as translation, speaker recognition, facial API, so Jester could recognize me. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we could do with this. I could train a custom vision model to identify individual toys that Jester has, for example. Um, this, this stuff's really cool. It's really a lot of fun to work with. Um, I encourage you to play around with it. If you'd like to take a look at my code, you can go out to mattelan.dev slash doggo, and that'll give you a bunch of resources related to this talk, as well as a link to my GitHub uh, which is also pictured here if you want to go out and take a look at that repository. Now, one note, this application won't work out of the box because I don't have my Azure Cognitive Services keys and other things checked in for reasons I've been referencing during this talk. If you'd like to learn more about this application or uh, other things we can do with Cognitive Services, data science in general, check out you know a few of my resources such as accessibleai.dev or my YouTube channel. Uh, I'd be happy to tell you more on Twitter, LinkedIn as well, if you wanted to reach out to, to me. Microsoft also has some really fantastic stuff on Microsoft Learn. They got a lot of learning paths. There's also the AI 900 uh, Azure AI Fundamentals uh, certification, which is a great one to study for. It takes about a week to study for and pass, and it never expires. And if you're a little bit more serious about it, you might go into the, the Azure AI Engineer uh, certification, which, which focuses heavily on Azure Cognitive Services. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for the uh, Global AI Student Conference for having me, and I hope you enjoyed this and learned something new. So we are back at the Global AI Student Conference. Unfortunately, uh, Matt cannot join us online, so we cannot ask him some questions. But after watching his session, I have to admit that I just want to go home and see how to use other cognitive services to automate my cat. <laughs> now, before introducing our next speaker, I want to remind you that we have a Cloud Seed Challenge about uh, Azure AI. You can go to the challenge and complete all the learn modules and see how can you compete to your friends and people from around the world using our leaderboard. You can also claim a unique learner bag uh, that is provided to you. You can go to the website, scan the QR code, and claim your unique NFT in your wallet. So we'll be back in a few minutes with our next speaker. <laughs>